I called this the weight of unforgiveness uh, and, and why I did that. Let me explain. So I, I'm giving an application or an illustration of this as something that we could understand. So we just came out of the Christmas season. And let me, take, let me just take you guys on a little journey of my Christmas season of, of what, what we had in my life. So it usually starts around Young at Heart. So we have Young at Heart, and they have this giant buffet of desserts. Have any of you guys been to Young at Heart? I mean, and my, my weakness is sweet. So most people go up and get something, and then I like to try the top three best. That's, the, you know, just like on the table and things. Then we had parties, staff parties, things like that. And then a lot of gifts that we get, stuff like that, are cookies and cakes and, and things like that. So it's a whole season of junk food. It's, it's a wonderful, I think that's why it's like people say the most wonderful time of the year. I don't know if it's because of the junk food or, or that. So on Christmas Day, Jenny got up and she made homemade cinnamon rolls on Christmas morning. They were incredible. So we had this huge breakfast, and then that night our meal was junk food. That's right. So we were like, we, we were staying home, and we were leaving the next day. So Jenny said, I don't want a bunch of leftovers. So we did like junk food. Then we went on this trip, and we went home, and my sister puts out a buffet of cookies and things. Literally every night we hang out at the house. And it's an entire just containers of cookies and fudge and all these other things. Then we have dessert after meals. And then we go out during the day and get junk food. Like we go and get, you know, drinks and, and frappuccinos and all that other stuff. Then we went to Jenny's mom's house. And Jenny's mom's has this, like they, they live in the middle of nowhere in LJ, uh, Georgia. One of the only things nearby is a Dunkin' Donuts. So we make multiple trips to there. And then we come home and we have donuts. And then the last night... We went out after doing all that and got ice cream, and we came back and then figured out a bunch of ways to put toppings on it. So needless to say, one of the biggest worries I had coming home was whether or not I was going to fit in any of my clothes for church the next day. It was just like, it's this season. And then you think, everybody has this idea that we start going on diets because it's the beginning of the new year. No, we go on diets because we're recovering from the Christmas season. That's why try to get out of that. And this verse is not talking necessarily about the physical weight, but the same application comes. And then we're going to be in Ephesians 4, but I just want to kind of set this up. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Now think about what a weight is. A weight is something that holds you down, holds you back, slows you down. And this illustration is the idea of running the race that God has set before us pursuing the mission that he's given us. It's action. It is forward action that he's given us to do. And he says, and lay aside every weight and the sin, which so doth easily, easily besets us. Literally, it holds us back, slows us down and trips us up and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So we've got this illustration. If, and I'm not a runner. I've never been one of these guys to do that kind of thing is for like a fun or a sport or whatever. But I do understand the concept is, is you don't run with weight. You don't run with things that are going to slow you down. And I just started thinking about this and I put this in your notes. What are you carrying into the new year that God doesn't want you to have that's going to slow you down? And if the idea that God has set before us is to run, I mean, literally make application to that. In, in your ministry that you have or whatever, that word run is implying to pursue, to have passion. It's not walk. It's not just apathetically going through it. It's, it's a passion that should be there. And he's given this illustration and he says, let me put it like this. Sin in your life or, or other things that might be just clutter in your life hold you back. It slows you down. It gets in the way. It messes, it messes up what God has in, uh, in store for us. So he gives us these instructions in life on how Christians should live. He talks about the importance of forgiveness. And obviously from the title, you guys know that I'm talking about forgiveness because I think going into this that there's a lot of us that could look back on 2019, maybe 2020, may, maybe even further back than that, when there's somebody that has crossed us, a family, whatever. And I'm not just talking maybe something recent. It could be something that has been in your family for years, just saying, we don't talk to them or I don't associate with them anymore. And, and, and guys, this isn't specific. If there's something that every single one of us deal with, it's this. It, we all struggle with this. That's why I thought, man, 
it, with something that is so important. That, now notice Ephesians 4.29. And we're, this is a Bible study. We're just going to read verse by verse. And then I want you guys to kind of write things down. Like the first thing that we're going to look at is corrupt. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. What, what does the word corrupt mean? It's, it, it means disrespectful, evil, hateful. Things that tear somebody down. I'll tell you, that's so easy to come into our lives to, to say something. Maybe it's something you did to somebody else, or maybe somebody else did it to you, but it's easy for those words to come out. It's corrupt. The Bible's laying these things out. To, that, uh, it was funny. Um, Friday, I went to this store. Uh, I, I love going to Bargains Galore. Have any of you, do you, any of you guys go to Bargains Galore? It's on, it's on Bryce Road. It's this little place. They get like pallets of return stuff, so everything in the store is 50% off. So it's like, it's one of those kind of stores. But anyways, I love going in there and trying to find deals. I guess in the parking lot, before I got in there, there was two ladies that almost hit each other in the parking lot. I, I have no idea what happened. They just nearly hit each other. So they went inside, and they were both a little heated at each other. So I, I didn't know. So all of a sudden, the lady's walking out the door, and the other lady makes a comment to her. And that lady turned around like, you know, ready, ready to go into it. And they start shouting at each other and getting mad at each other. It was so funny, the words that were coming. These are grown adults. And she turned around and said, you, you got a nasty car anyways. You know, you got a 1988, whatever. And I'm like, what, what in the world here? They're just and yelling at her car. And the other lady comes back, no joke. And she says, I could drop $35,000 on any car I wanted to right now. I was like, oh, okay, like, how childish is this? She turns around and yells back at that lady and says, what you really need is Jenny Craig. That's what she said to her. And I am like, holy cow. You say, Pastor, what did you do? I did what anybody should have done. I said, I've got $5 on the lady by the door. And it was, no, I'm kidding. So. But I'm just absolutely blown away. The, the owner of the store had to come out and literally, and they're still yelling at each other and things like that. You say, that's crazy. No, let me tell you, that stuff happens a whole lot more than we think. And I'm talking about maybe some of you are even thinking about something like that in the last four months of being home for Christmas. Pastor Dave and I tell this story of like a number of years ago, way before he came here, that we were at Christmas, both youth pastors, and we got into it one year. I'm not going into the details. It was so dumb, but we still laugh about it to this day. And it was just, and you say, why did you do that? Because we're human flesh. Now, he'll tell you I started it. Yeah, I mean, like, and he's wrong. Is Dave in here? <laughs> I should, should check on that before I said. But corrupt is anything that comes out of your mouth that tears them down or goes against the Bible. The Bible just made it very clear for Christians, there is to be no corrupt communication coming out of your mouth. And I'll tell you, when we were lost and before we were saved, there was justification all the time because we would say, well, they had it coming to them or they deserved it or they shouldn't have crossed me. I guarantee you those two ladies that were fighting in that thing, if you were to pull them aside, they would both be like, well, they started it. How juvenile. And you say, well, they're like that. Well, how can Christians be? How should be Christians? And it says, but they which, uh, this is what he said in the next part of the verse, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. What, is, what, what do you think of when it says that to the use of edifying? What does that mean? Lifting up. Builds them up. The Bible literally says, out of your mouth. That doesn't mean all the time that you're going up to people and saying, you're a great guy, you're a great guy. Truth also is edifying. You know, you, you, you can go up to people and say truth, but say this truth in love, and that's still going to help them be better. To your kids, you're not always saying you should have you cleaned your room. You should have. It's speaking truth. Words to edify. You say, why is this important? Let me get to this. You talk about wanting revival. I talk about wanting revival. Talk about God moving. Talk about souls being saved at Easter, souls being saved on Sunday, your family being reached. And you say, that's not a big deal. And some of you in the back of your mind say, well, I've had that and we've had conflict and falling out. It's not a big deal. Look at what verse is connected to this. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Grieve not. 
You say, well, that's just a coincidence. No, do you understand this is all the same subject? You know what the word grieve is saying or, or, or talking about in this? To distress and literally means to, to cause grief, to be in heaviness, to make sorrow. Literally, it's saying, God's saying, you take any family, whether it's a church family or an individual family or whatever it is, the Bible is literally saying that God is not at work in those families when you are grieving the Holy Spirit of God. Actually, what I could define this is the, it's the opposite of revival. This is the opposite of revival. God cannot be at work in a church where there's division. God cannot be at work in a home that's division. God cannot be at work in a family where there's division. Grieve not. Whereby you are sealed by the day of redemption, talking about the power of God. It robs our joy. It robs the working of God. The Spirit of God is what speaks to our heart, that brings joy, that brings peace. You say it's not a big deal. I'm talking about a weight that we carry into the big new year, and you just say, you know what? I just wrote them off. I'm not talking to them. And God says, let me explain what you're doing. You are limping into the new year. You are powerless. You are weak. It is not good. It's not healthy. It's not okay. He says all this. And then listen, he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. We'll study that here in a minute. With all malice, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven you. You, you, you think about what all the, he's saying this. He's talking about all these things produce so much anger and clamor, and it doesn't just stay confined. All of these things grow. It doesn't just, it's just like any sickness or any infection. It doesn't stay where it's at. It will turn into all these things. And that's what it's describing, how it gets worse and worse and worse. I've heard people say things like this. They said, well, they crossed me, or I'll never trust them again. That person makes me sick. Or if you only knew what they did, however we want to label it, if there's a division, if there's any bitterness or whatever, it's not right. There's no excuse. It's never okay. It's not okay. That's what he was saying through all this. You can say, well, that's just the way I am. Or if you knew how I am. And I've heard, I've heard people say things like that and just say, well, Tony, one thing you're going to learn about me. No, it doesn't matter. Let, let's stop. Let's back up. Let's back up. We're talking about Christians here. Ephesians 4, 22. And, it's, and he's talking about, he talks about those things which are corrupt according to the de- deceitful lust. But verse 23 is, and says, but be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You see, you were corrupt, but you, the Bible says that you have a new way of handling things. You have a new mind. You're not the same anymore. It's not okay. Whatever those excuses or those things that you say, See, before, when someone crossed you, you got even. Or when someone upset you, you spoke your mind. You, people say, well, you got to learn me. I just, learn about me. I just speak my mind. When you're mad, everyone knew it. When someone hurt you, you crossed them off. I, you know, I've, I've had people say that. Well, I just wrote them off. Can Christians just write people off? Now, we'll get into it in a minute because the Bible's talking about forgiveness. It's, it's the same way that we treat each other. We're supposed to be in the same way that God's treats us, that relationship, does God ever write us off? No. Has God ever gone to any Christian and say, that's it, all right? So God's making this illustration. It's never okay for a Christian. It's never okay. It, 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 it's terrible. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The word renewed, renovated, reformed, changed. The Bible talks about how God makes all things new. The spirit of your mind, the way that you think, the way that you view things, Literally meaning that if corrupt communication comes out of your mouth and things are bad and you walk away, the spirit of our mind turns around and says, you've got to fix this. That's what the get this way, saying that's not how I used to be. Well, it doesn't matter how you used to be. The Bible talks about you're a new man. You're not the same anymore. It says, as a matter of fact, it says that in verse 24, and that you put on the new man, which is after God and created in righteousness and true holiness. Verse 24 is talking about being Christ-like. He says, doesn't matter. The word new literally means new. It's not the same as it was before. See, the new man has a new attitude, a new behavior, a new way to look at sin. We're, we're children of God. We've been born again. So what does this mean? Simply saying you're different. Simply saying what that lady did or those two ladies did in that place could happen to us too. It, it really could. Now, 
Honestly, if we're being controlled by the Spirit of God, and Pastor Chris talked about forbearance last week and some of those things about being controlled by the Spirit of God, hopefully we're under the Spirit of God enough that this doesn't get to that. That's the, that's the goal. But at the same time, if it does, the new man teaches us that we're to go back to the Bible and do things the way that the Bible tells us to do it, to live it out. So it says in verse 25, Wherefore put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Does the Bible tell us that we can't be angry? Nope. It says be angry and sin not. Sin not. So there's a thing, and just say, you tell me that I have to be perfect? You're telling me? No. Guys, I promise you, we all get frustrated. We all get mad. We're even going to get mad at each other. You get mad at the people that you love the most. You, you get mad at your spouse. You get mad at your best friend. It's not a matter of that. The Bible is just telling us how to handle it. It says, be angry and sin not. Literally mean, don't let it turn into bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking is what it says. Don't let it get to that. That's what it was talking about through this. I promise you, people will make you want to hit them. I mean, just that's, that's just the truth. People will drive you nuts. People will make you say things that you don't want to say. Things will bother you. So let's lay out the facts about people. People will let you down. Church people will let you down. And I say that to us as a church because this is the truth. Inside the walls of this, when people hurt us here, it hurts more than anything. You say, why? Guys, tell me why. Why does it hurt? Why does this hurt more than other things? You tell me. If, if a Christian hurts you, and a Christian says something, a Christian stabs you in the back, or a Chris, Christian sta- uh, gossips about, why does that hurt more than most things? Because they're your family. They're Christians, and they know better. That's, and that's what I've had people say to me and says, I expect it from people in the world, but in here it's a safe place. It's in here we have the Spirit of God. And I go to church to find something different. I go here to be loved. I come here because people are supposed to do what's right. Guys, we're supposed to do what's right, but I'm here to tell you because we're flesh, we don't always do what's right. And that's why the Bible has to give us verses like this to say, hey, you're going to get angry, but you've got to learn to do what's right. And guys, what I'm about to get into, I promise you, laying this out, nobody's going to come into this and be like, well, I didn't know that, just like we were talking about last week. But I think some of these things have to be revisited so that we know how to deal with them. Because the Bible says this is how you deal with it. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Tell me, tell me what does that mean? If it says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath, what is the Bible telling us to do? Not hold a grudge. Not hold a grudge. Literally is saying, you need to deal with it. You need to deal with it. If you're upset, wrath, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Do not let it happen. Because what will happen, like any sickness, it will spread, it gets worse. Look at verse 27. You say, this is not a big deal. Listen, 27, neither give place to the devil. Literally, neither let the devil come in and have opportunity. Put it like this. I know in spiritual warfare, we don't understand it fully. It happens all around us. When there's fighting, division, backstabbing, arguing, what, however you want to put corrupt communication, and you sit there and you get into it and you say, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm just going to bury it. I'm going to write them off. I'm not going to love them or whatever. It's the same thing as going to the door, opening the door and saying, hey, Satan, come, Satan, come on in and do whatever you want. You say, I would never do that. You realize what the Bible is telling us is that's what we do spiritually? We say, man, Satan's wreaking havoc on America and Satan's wreaking havoc on churches and, man, there's all these things out. Maybe we've invited it. Maybe we sit there and talk about how Satan's winning and doing all these things. Maybe some of it's self-inflicted. And I'm, I'm not saying that I can point out situations in churches or families or whatever, but I'm just saying it's human nature to have conflict. It's human nature for things to be upset. So uh, Ephesians 4.31, Let all bitterness and wrath and clamor and anger and, and evil speaking be put away with you with all malice. What is the second word? In that verse, all. all. Do, you, do you understand that the, literally the Bible doesn't leave out anything? Because this is what happens with us as Christians. 
I know the Bible says that, but have you guys ever done that or heard people say things like that? I know what you're saying, Pastor Tony, but, and then they come back and say, let me tell you, and then you'll understand. You realize what God was saying, let all bitterness and all wrath and all anger and all clamor and all evil speaking be put away with you, all of it, nothing. There can't be any of it. Let me go through this. This is what we're going to do. How do we fix this? What, how do we deal with this? And I'll, I'll, the, the Bible says these things that have to be put away from us. Bitterness is a poison. It's a feeling towards someone. Can't be there. You want to put yourself in check? That's what the Bible is saying. If bitterness is there, this is what happens. Somebody mentions your name or their name to you, and you flinch or you have bad feelings or emotions towards them. You sit there, oh, sh- you know, it's like, oh, whatever, and, you know, that's how they are. If there's anything negative or clamor or, or and I'll explain that in a minute, or any kind of uh, uh, bad talking that comes out of that, corrupt communication that comes, that means there's bitterness there. Maybe all of us need to check our hearts with that. Maybe there's bitterness there when you see them and you go the other direction. Maybe there's bitterness there if you find out that somebody's going to be at that family meeting or at the house or whatever and you avoid it. Just saying, I don't want to deal. It's bitterness. It's, it's become bitter in, in your life. It's, it, it, the Bible talks about it grows into uh, wrath, which is fierceness. It means a desire to get even. It means an, a desire to uh, lash out back at them. Clamor is an outcry or an outburst. You, you vocalize it and just say, man, if you only knew. It, it doesn't contain. It gets worse. It grows bigger and bigger through this. It, it talks about evil speaking. Is when you start saying to other people, Man, did you hear about them? Or you wouldn't believe what they did. Or if I, if I had a minute to tell you everything, you'd, never, you'd, you'd be the same way as I am. It's evil speaking. It's tearing it down. Now you're spreading it to other people. And all these things go to verse 30 where it's grieving the Holy Spirit of God. Let's, let's fill this outline out and let's just break this down. And of course, here's the Bible gives us in this passage the approach to forgiveness. This is, this is how we approach forgiveness. Now, it's laid out right in this passage. So, number one, the approach, approaching the situation with kindness. The Bible says in verse 30, be kind one to another. Be kind one to another. Does that sound like an option? It's not an option. So, be kind one to another. It doesn't matter if they've crossed the line. It doesn't matter if we're on bad terms. It doesn't matter all these things that we do. The, the word kind means to be useful or better means to, to be gracious to them. If, if, if there's conflict or whatever, maybe there's a situation where, where you've been the recipient of this, okay? And it's, things are not good, and you know things are not good. It's easy to avoid them. But the Bible says, literally, what you should be doing is make yourself useful to them. Man, can I help you with that? Let me carry that. Open the door. Be kind to them. Break down the walls. That's what God did to us. He came and he started breaking down the walls that separated us from God. It goes against human nature. Let me tell you guys, what I'm talking about goes against human nature. We want to run. We want to avoid. We don't want to talk about it. It goes against everything that we are. But you understand why it says grieve not the Holy Spirit? What is it that helps us do what we normally would not do ourselves? It's the Holy Spirit. the, The passage is saying that because it would be natural for you to sit there and just say, I don't want to do it. And then the Holy Spirit comes and shakes you and says, but you need to. It doesn't matter. You need to. Kindness is the first thing that it says that be kind one to another. The next thing it says tenderhearted literally means to be merciful or quick to, to, quick to be moved by compassion, sensitive to the situation. Do you know what this would be in the practical sense of what the Bible is saying here? Saying there might be more to this situation than you understand. Rather than hashing out, you're, you step back and saying, I wonder if they're dealing with something. I wonder what's going on in their life. I wonder if they just got bad news. I wonder if they're waiting on test results that nobody even knows about. Tender-hearted, taking that into consideration. Then the last thing it says, forgiving one another. And I know that that's the whole subject of what we're talking about. Be willing to let it go. Be willing to let it go. Now, this is cool because I got to tell you guys, this right here is a choice. If, if we start adding up all the facts and say they don't deserve it or whatever... It's, 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 a, it's a choice. And it, this, is, this is an amazing thing because Christ has forgiven us. It says forgiving them the way that Christ has forgiven us. And I thought about this. The Bible says this, For I 
for if I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and to their sins and their iniquities, will I remember no more. And if you were part of my Bible study on, uh, on Wednesday night, we studied this. And it's hard to understand that idea. And me and Greg were actually talking before church about for forgiving and forgetting. Is it possible to forgive somebody and forget? Usually not. Usually not. Why is that? Because we, we have no way to wipe our memories of what happened. So I'm going to ask you guys a principle when it comes to this. Didn't the Bible just say that God forgives and forgets? Will I remember, remember no more? And you just sit there and say, I'll never get over what they did for me. If you just knew how they hurt me, if you knew what they said to me, if you knew how they stabbed me in the back. See, only God gives us the power to do what he did for us. So this is what the Bible talks about what God did in his salvation. This, let's take this pen as the illustration of the sin. Okay, we know that it's there. God knows that it's there. It doesn't matter where I hide it. God knows that it's there. But what God does is he chooses to take it out of the way. Literally, and we put this to, uh, under the blood of Jesus Christ, as far as the east is from the west, or buried in the bottom of the sea. There's lots of illustrations that the Bible talks about it. But literally, instead of it being out front, God chooses to put it behind him. Does God know it's there? Absolutely. God is infinite in knowledge. He's not on... But it's a matter of God chooses to put it behind him as for a fact that I know it's there, but I'm not going to let it come between me and you. Guys, what we're talking about right here is a choice that I choose. I want my relationship with you more than that because at the end of the day, we could come up with excuses and reasons all day long. Why? Because, it, it, well, they didn't really mean it when they said they were sorry, but there was more to the story and whatever. It's a choice to say, listen, I want to let it Go. Literally, I want to put it behind. I don't want to hold this over your head anymore. That's what he was talking about. We have to be willing to let it go. God chose to take it out of the way. We have to choose to take it out of the way. And God gives us this example of forgiveness. See, we, we feel like every situation might be the exception. Have you guys ever noticed that? That you teach on something like this and everybody's like, yeah, but if you only knew. Pastor Tony, if you only knew. You realize that everybody has an exception of some reason that they should not be forgiven. So be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. At the end of that verse, it brings us in. It's like, oh my goodness. He literally says, this is how it is. You've got to forgive them the way that Christ has forgiven you. Now, when we put it into that perspective, it's almost hard to understand. It's like, man, but I'm not God and I don't have that. So in the Bible, we have this illustration. And I'm not going to give the whole, uh, read this whole thing. But in Matthew 18, verse 21, it gives the illustration or a visual of what that was like. And Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times. And Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee unto seven times, but unto 70 times seven. Does anybody know the math on that? 490. 490. So the principle is, if you forgive them 491 times, you don't have to forgive them anymore. No. So what is it talking about? It's a phrase they used in those days to mean forever. Forever. It just keeps going and keeps going. And God took it and he multiplied it out. And he says, There is a kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which took account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon... One was brought unto him and owed him 10,000 talents for as much as he had to pay. His Lord commanded him, be, uh, him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and his payments to be made. The servant therefore fell down, worshipped him and said, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord, oh, that servant was moved with compassion, loosed him and forgave him his debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his own fellow servants and owed him a uh, hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that which thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. But he would not. But when he went out into prison till he should pay the debt, and his fellow servant saw what was done, and he was very sorry, he came and told unto the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all thy, that debt because thou desirest of me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant and had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him into uh, tormentors 
till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall thy Father in heaven do also unto you, if from your hearts forgive not every one of his brothers their trespasses. Now put this in perspective, and I put this in your notes. This was the illustration here. 10,000 talents in today's money, okay? If this was silver talents from their day and age, it would be about $16 million. Okay, just, just to put in, if you guys realize what the comparison was, 100 pence would be about $14. Okay, now we all know the illustration of what he was trying to say is the man come up to him and owed, let's say, an, a, a number that would be, you couldn't pay back no matter what. There's no way to pay it back. And that's our sin debt with God. We deserve hell. We deserve to be condemned. There's no way for me to get out of this. We fall down before God. We ask for forgiveness and God forgives us. But then we go around and somebody else in there and it's the same comparison of the 14 bucks. Somebody comes up to him and says, man, I, I'm sorry. And you say, you know what? You crossed the line. You let me down. You hurt me or whatever. I can't just let this go. We're not friends anymore. Or whatever the situation is. God said, you understand how disgusting that is. And, and in a sense, in the illustration, this God's saying, and it's so petty. It's so petty for Christians to be like this. And how dare God do so much for us? And then Christians, we sit there and hold things over. It doesn't matter in light of eternity. And God said, I've given you this example and how we sit there and hold things or not forgive or not let people forgive us or whatever it is. But then the Bible gives us the avenue of forgiveness. Now, in, in this way of, of seeking it out, because it just doesn't happen. If there's problems or conflict, now we don't have to go, and let's, let's just get into Matthew 18. Who can tell me from the reading of Matthew 18, what, are, what is the Bible talking about? Let, let me just read these verses. Moreover, if thy brother trespass against thee, go to him and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou shalt gain a brother. What is the first step if there's problems with anybody in the church, anybody in your family? What is the first step? Go to them. You go to them. You don't start on Facebook. You know, all these things that we do. And in our culture today, one of the places that we vent, that's what we call it, is like, man, I am so mad at Now, that's all the posts that they'll put on Facebook. And I know I bring this up all the time, but I see it all the time. They'll just put us, I'm so mad right now. Or some people are so dumb. Or, you know, just whatever this phrase is. What are people honestly doing when they do something like that? They're fishing. They just want somebody to come back and say, oh, man, what happened? You know, it's like, it's that. And you know what we're doing by that? It's evil speaking. We're, we're, we're spreading it. We're, we're spreading the sickness and the illness. It's not fixing. It's causing division. It's causing problems. Step two, if he will not hear you, the Bible says, but if he will not hear thee, then take, two, take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word should be established. There's accountability. So take somebody else and just say, hey, I really want to fix this. I don't want there to division. I don't want the arguing. I don't want to fight. I don't want there to be the awkwardness. I don't want to get around you and feel uncomfortable. I want there to, this to be good. And therefore, the, uh, the witnesses are there to make sure that there isn't the false accusations or being able to talk it out. Because I promise you, most of the time that you're going to somebody, it's not even what you really thought. I thought you said this. It's a misconception. It's miscommunication. When you said this the other day, this is how I took it. That's not what I meant at all. That's why the Bible was saying, don't let the sun go on your wrath. Most things can be solved with 10 minutes, but we will hold on to things for 10 years. And by the way, they escalate and they build and they build and they build and they get worse and they worse. And it's horrible for churches. It's horrible for Christians. Now, I don't like this step, but we have to say it. Step three, if he neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be as thee, as a heathen and a man and a publican. You say, what is that? That's church, that's church discipline. Now, why is that so important? I tell you today, and most people, if they were to read this and you were to actually do this, they, they would want to fire me, honestly. People would say, man, he's, he's so hard or this or that. But in the reality, if you have somebody that's causing division in the church and they go around arguing and fighting and spreading discord, the Bible says you need to go to them. If you won't listen, you go with other people. And if they won't, it's time to go. Guys, why is that, that so important? What, why did the Bible say that it's being so strong? So that they don't hurt the church. They don't hurt the church. You know what God's striving for? Unity, unity, unity. Satan is always out to divide, divide, divide. 
If somebody's out there trying to pull the church apart, they're working for the devil to try to weaken the church. It's dangerous. It's critical. All these things. So we close with this. The purpose of forgiveness. Now, I think we'd all agree and say, if it's something's not right, it's sin. If someone, we, we have to apologize. We have to accept the apology. We have to go to them. We have to talk through problems and all this. But the thing is, why? And if we were to step back and look at the big picture, why did God say this is so important? Why is this so important? So this is, this is how God has established the church. We are members one of another. The Bible actually says this. So verse 25, read with me, just to put this pieces together, what God's saying. Wherefore, put away lying, speaking every main truth with his neighbor. That's what we're in. For we are members one of another. The Bible in the middle of this says, by the way, this isn't just a matter of you saying, Troy, we're done with you. I don't, I don't like you or we're not friends anymore. And you write people off. God says, by the way, you're members one with another. In the same passage, this is how far he takes the members of one with another. The fact that we're connected. Jump back to verse 15. Read verse to 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even on Christ, for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted, by which every joint supplieth. According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto its edifying itself in love. Here's the illustration that he said. So you're the body. Literally, the hands, the feet, the, the, I mean, all the, all the different working parts is what he said. So he said, listen, it's not just somebody that you can write off and saying, I don't need you or get out of here. I, I don't want you in my life anymore. That's like literally the illustration that he's saying. It would be like saying that I don't need my arm anymore. Or I don't need my leg anymore. And, and God's looking and saying, do you understand how foolish? Do you understand how you're crippling yourself as a church or a family or whatever? So here's what the Bible says, the effectual working of the measure of every part because we're connected. That, that is, this is what God wants. Because if my arm is out of joint, I am crippled at what I'm trying to do. If my leg is out of joint, I am crippled what the effectual working, we are members one with the other. Do you know what Satan is constantly trying to do? This is what he's trying to divide. This is unforgiveness. This is where conflict comes in, and I'm not talking to them anymore. But the Bible says, do you understand? You are members one with another. This isn't just somebody that you can write off. You are part of their life. But God's saying right this, Satan is constantly. If the church keeps getting divided, God's not doing that. Guys, you think that's why the Bible says neither give place to the devil because he's constantly going to do that. And the more he whispers to him, the more they get divided over this way. Do you guys see what the Bible is talking about here of this? This happens all the time. Do you know why? Because we're flesh and it's in us. And we're going to say words of, why would you do that? You're so dumb. Uh, you, you don't care about me. Da, da, da. That stuff is naturally going to come out of us. But then we apply to, you know what we do? Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. You want to say, I've got to fix this. You say, that's not in me. When we turn around, the Bible says, you are made new in Jesus Christ. The old man is not there. The new man is there. Don't grieve the Spirit of God. So God says there, God brings us back together in forgiveness is removing the things that divided us in the first place. Guys, if we're going to be a church that is strong. We have to make sure that there are no divisions. If you're going to be a family that is strong, there cannot be any divisions. Because you know what that is? Division is weakness. And anytime there's weakness or division, it literally means that we gave place to the devil. Nothing good is ever going to come from any church situation or any family situation when the devil has stepped into it. Sin divides, it's the last statement, but forgiveness unites. Sin divides, but forgiveness unites us as Christians. So you say it's not a big deal. Man, I don't care if there's this much. Let all bitterness and wrath, if there's this much, I would rather go to him and just say, hey, are we okay? Why are you saying that? Well, I just want to make sure the other day, just make sure. And the Bible says, if they will hear you out, you have gained a brother. You've gained a friend. And people come back and say, but what if there's nothing there? I don't want to start something. Let me tell you, if they're a true Christian, true friend, and the Spirit of God's working, they will be honored and blessed the fact that you care so much about the relationship that you're willing to bring it up. As I know that there is things involved in this, 
deep hurts and things that you say, I've gone to them five times and ten times and it's out of my control. At some point, all you can do is what you know to do that's right. You can't change their heart. You can't change their mind. You can't make them do it. But I'll tell you, on your side, you know what that's doing? When you've done everything that you can, you take that weight of unforgiveness and you lay it down and we run the race. Let's run the race. Let's not let anything hold us back, hold us down, or get in the way.